All right, for more on this, I'm joined by our guests in Houston, Texas, Mohamed Nablusi, attorney and vice general coordinator for the Palestinian Youth Movement. Mohamed, do you believe that this uh, ceasefire is going to prevent any further escalations in the near term? No, I absolutely don't. I, I think, as we can see with the sort of clashes that have occurred, the um, firing of tear gas and, and rubber-coated steel bullets at the worshippers at Al-Aqsa Mosque just after the ceasefire was announced, this won't change. And, and as long as there's popular uh, resistance and confrontation with the occupation and uh, the various encroachments on Palestinian religious uh, and cultural sites, uh, there's going to be continued uh, sort of back and forth as long as there's siege and occupation. Mohammed, earlier in the show, we played a soundbite from uh, Joe Biden. Uh, the president was saying that, you know, really a two-state solution is the only way forward. What does that make you think when you hear that? And we've heard this so often. Is a two-state solution even viable at this point? No, I think it's a, it's a fantasy. I, I think anyone who holds to the notion that there will be two states and, and this one territory um, is uh, diluted. I think the reality of the situation is, is settlements only continue to increase. There's expansion and what is called inside of Israel the Judaization of Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem. All of these things are not going to stop. Uh, the political will inside of Israeli society is in favor of continuing settlements, in favor of continued occupation and siege. And until that changes, there won't be any sort of prospect for uh, resolution on the ground. The reality of the situation is, is we have one state already, and that state is governed by the state of Israel, and it's uh, subjecting Palestinians, depending on where they find themselves in that territory, to different forms of rule. In Gaza, it's siege. It's an open-air prison. It's essentially a concentration camp. In the West Bank, it's military occupation, uh, effectively Bantu stands with semi-autonomous rules for particular territories, where the PA, an undemocratic uh, entity, is essentially effectively just a security coordination apparatus for uh, the state of Israel and administering their occupation on a civil level. And in East Jerusalem, Palestinians do not have any voting rights. They don't have any sort of prospect for rule. Um, there, there's continued encroachment on Palestinian neighborhoods and holy sites. And in 48 Palestine, or what is called modern-day Israel, uh, there is further uh, second-class citizen status for Palestinians there. And so these conditions, this system of apartheid that extends from the river to the sea, is effectively a one state already. The question is, do we face that reality and move towards a solution that sees uh, a secular democratic uh, state within that territory where there's rights for Palestinians, where there's reparations for Palestinians uh, uh, victimized by Zionism, and where there's the right of return that's allowed of Palestinians who are languishing in refugee camps in the surrounding states. That is the, that is the path toward solution. This notion of two states is something that is held up to keep Palestinians at bay, when in reality, we're not going away. The Palestinian struggle, the Palestinian uh, will to uh, be able to access all of Palestine, to be able to live within their homes and villages as free people is not something that will be relinquished by Palestinians. Beth, Mohammed, I want to ask you about a, a new generation of Palestinian activists that's really been noticed by many around the world in the last couple of weeks. And I want to ask you, how much this new generation of Palestinian activists, many of them part of the diaspora, how much has that changed the way politics are approached by Palestinians around the world? Well, I, I think, you know, following the Oslo process, what happened was uh, there was a delinking of the Palestinian diaspora from uh, internal Palestinian politics. And that was, uh, in a way, uh, the reproduction of geographic and political fragmentation within the Palestinian society, uh, you know, following the Nakba. And the new emergence of these youth, these youth who grew up under the Oslo process, both inside of Palestine and outside, um, uh, have come to recognize the failures of the Oslo process, the failures of this notion that there will be an independent Palestinian state, and the need to move back towards uh, a multitude of tactics that were utilized historically by Palestinians including a general strike that resulted in the loss of $40 million to the Israeli construction industry in just one day. These sorts of tactics, popular confrontation with the occupation, mobilization across Palestine, 
and the resumption of the centrality of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. These are all carried by Palestinians, Palestinian youth, especially across the entire globe. And this is, we're not talking about one or two cities. We're talking about the entire globe. We're talking about from Madrid to Berlin to Los Angeles to here in Houston, Texas, to Palestinians in Chile, the Palestinian and the refugee camps. All of these youth are mobilizing under a banner of justice, under a banner of dignity. And not only are they mobilizing for their own struggle, they're mobilizing in support of other struggles of justice. Uh, Palestinians, uh, youth especially, you know, we, we're, we're, we've carried sort of the legacies of, our, of our, our, our families and our ancestors in terms of how we understand our experience as Palestinians. But most importantly, we've carried the principles that have undergirded the Palestinian cause, which is justice, which is liberation, which is dignity. Uh, these sort of principles extend to our daily lives. They extend to our relationships with our peers here in this country. It extends to our relationship to our society around us. And it means that we will, as long as we believe in these principles, we're going to un be unwavering as it relates to uh, the conditions of our people. And I just want to quickly address one of the things that your, your, your other guests mentioned. He says that we support these sort of uh, continued hostilities, civil war, and things like that. Um, yet, in his opening, he mentioned he had made no mention of the deaths of Palestinians. He had made no mention of the settlements in relationship to the undermining of so-called peace. All of these things are what perpetuate uh, the conflict, so-called so conflict. What we need is justice. What we need is an end to a, a decades-long occupation, was, which is an effective apartheid system. What we need is to look at the experience of South Africa, where segregationists who were screaming about the dangers of civil war, who were screaming about the dangers of black rule uh, to avoid an end to apartheid, now look like uh, uh, the um, uh, completely detached people they were. And so the reality of the situation is if we want peace, we need to confront that there is no uh, no, no two-state solution that could be set, put on the table that can reconcile with the fact that Palestinians are subject, subjugated uh, even in a two-state framework. That's not solving our problem. And Palestinian youth, uh, like myself, like the Palestinian youth and the youth movement, like the Palestinian youth who are on the front lines of struggle in Sheikh Jarrah, in Jerusalem, in Al-Aqsa Mosque, in Al-Lid, in Haifa, all over historic Palestine, we are not relinquishing our call for justice. And if people who view a call for justice see it as a, a call for civil war, then the problem is with them, not with us. Mohammed, uh, earlier you mentioned the word apartheid when talking about Israeli government policies. Beth also mentioned the word apartheid in describing Israeli government policies. And I want to ask you about the fact that in the past week we have heard some very prominent progressive voices in the Democratic Party in the U.S. speaking from Congress or tweeting and using that word, saying that there are apartheid policies being carried out by Israel toward the Palestinians. Does that signal to you that there is a major shift uh, afoot right now uh, when it comes to the U.S. government and perhaps its potential policy toward Israel? I, I wouldn't necessarily see it as a shift with the U.S. government and its policies towards Israel. Uh, the, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, while it's growing, is still a small segment of, of the Democratic Party. I think I still think there's bipartisan consensus around uh, unwavering and um, sort of uh, unconditional support for Israeli aggression against Palestinian lives. I mean, as echoed by uh, what your uh, other guest is saying, uh, what see, he seems to support himself, and uh, as he praises Biden and his approach to 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 what's happening to Palestinians in, in the territories. So while there is sort of new voices that are speaking, and I think there has been a considerable media shift, I think the most dramatic shift, and this is where I will challenge the narrative of, of the U.S.'s role in this ceasefire. I don't believe the ceasefire was achieved as a result of negotiations purely looking at do we want to minimize death or not. I think this was Israel looking at the situation, looking at the international pressure, the waves of condemnations from various um, governments, the wave of condemnations from civil societies and masses all over the world. The fact that Palestinians mobilized using a multitude of tactics, not just a military engagement with the state of Israel, but a multitude of tactics to confront 
their ex uh, conditions, both in terms of ethnic cleansing in East Jerusalem, in terms of the uh, system of second-class citizenship in cities like Alid, Haifa, and Nazareth. These tactics, including the general strike, are what brought this bombardment of Gaza. And, and though your, your other guest continues to use the word both sides as completely flattening out the differences between both parties, one of which is a, 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 a large swath of people under occupation and siege and, and uh, systems of apartheid, and the other armed to the tooth by the greatest superpower in the world, the largest superpower in the world as we speak to, uh, today, um, is not one of sym symmetry. It's one of uh, an oppressor and an oppressed. Mm. And we must recognize that reality to reach any sort of solution. Mm. And the move and recognition towards apartheid is a step in that direction, but it's not It's not what we need. It, what we need is continued popular confrontation, including in the diaspora, including BDS uh, campaigns, including pressuring uh, corporations mm. complicit in occupation and our government to end its uh, military aid for the state of Israel.